Get a deeper connection with the Cougars of BYU Sports. God gives us a gift, and we use that gift until he takes it away. Deep blue. Just sitting down afterward and being really tired and thinking like, wow, I just won the U.S. championship. This, this is Deep Blue. Here's your host, Jason Shepard. Thanks for tuning in to a brand new episode of Deep Blue. This is the show where we get to know the person behind the number that you see on the field or the court. In this episode, we continue the conversation that we had with BYU basketball legend Mike Smith. First off, please go listen to the first part of our interview if you haven't done so already. Mike talked about his family life and career growing up in a non-sports house and how he almost played football and basketball for the Cougars. Now, on to part two. Since this is a podcast, people cannot see this, but the guy's decked out. He's got his BYU hat. I just he's took got my hat off. <laughs> so, see, the, this is this is the you know people are listening to this you know just the audio, but I want them to know that you came prepared. I see a BYU football helmet in the background. You are decked out in your Cougar blue, as it should be, right? I am, and I I, I love playing there. And yeah, you can see a Cougar helmet behind me. I think that is a Steve Young signed helmet. I probably won that at his golf tournament. There's a couple of photos back there and there's my sweetheart over my shoulder. And the coolest picture is the one on the wall right there. Jason. Yeah, what is that? Okay. So that is a golf course in Northern California and it's a golf course called Martis Camp. That's not important. What's important is that this 59 year old last summer, tried for and qualified for the United States Senior Amateur Golf Championship. So the top 156 senior amateur golfers in the world gathered there and played. I had to go through many stages of qualifying. It it was so fun. And so uh, I put that up there because it's a reminder that you're never too old to try new things. And I didn't grow up playing golf and didn't didn't compete playing golf and didn't even pick up a golf club till later. And so I just think it's so fun. And I think it's a I think it's a more noteworthy accomplishment than being a first round draft pick in the NBA. Honestly. Really? Oh, honestly, like the fact that I didn't grow up golfing and I'm 6'10, which there are no great golfers that size, to make it to the United States senior amateur on my second try, I think is pretty darn cool. So we had gotten to the point in your life where you were going to be 100% basketball at BYU. And to say that your career at BYU was phenomenal is probably somewhat of an understatement. Um, We could spend the entire episode talking about just your time in Provo. When you look back on those times, what stands out to you? What are the memories that you still hold on to? I will say a couple of things. Um, My freshman year, I was the new kid on the block. Um, I didn't know I would walk into that program and be a starter and maybe be the second or third best player, but I was. There's a critical point in that journey my freshman year where I was asked if I was going to go on a mission to, if I was going to go on a mission at the end of that season. Again, as a youngster, 18 year old, And somebody who was effusive and excited about the gospel, my reply to my coaching staff was, yes, I am going to (laughs) go, which I did go. I served in Argentina. It was a great time. I think in retrospect, I probably shouldn't have told them that because they began (laughs) to play me less. They began to uh, foresee their team the next year. I was like, wait, he's not going to be around. Devin's not going to be around. We better start playing other guys. And so 15 games into my freshman year, I had this terrific run, right? I was averaging 14, eight, and four as a freshman, 14 points, eight boards, four assists. And I thought, I didn't think it was easy, but I thought, this is awesome. Like, like I can't wait. And then the second half of the season, I played like five to seven minutes a game. And for no reason, except for what I now think was that. I do go on a mission. I come back my sophomore year and I will tell you this, I really feel like because I gave my all for two years on a mission and there'll be naysayers and doubters, I really feel like the Lord blessed me. Um, I, I couldn't I couldn't describe it any other way for me to go away from basketball for two years, not train, not shoot a ball, 
not work on any skills at all and come back three weeks before the season started my sophomore year and lead the team and the conference in scoring to me is unthinkable and unimaginable given what I had done for two years in Argentina, which was not touch a basketball. So I would bear witness and bear testimony that the Lord was with me and blessed me for that service. And my favorite year was my junior year. My junior year, we started the year 17 and 0. That's a starting lineup of, you know, Marty Hawes and Brian Taylor, uh, who was the best passer I've ever played with. And that would include Larry Bird and Magic Johnson. Myself at small forward, Jeff Chapman at power forward, and Jim Yusevich at center. And that was a darn good team. We didn't have a lot of help off the bench. I guess we had Andy Toulson and Nathan Call. And then we had little, little help inside coming off the bench. But between the three of us, we were able to handle it. We, I think we finished 26 and 6, but we were a four seed in the NCAA tournament. We won the first round. And I will always say, unfortunately, the stars didn't align. We end up playing Louisville in the second round. That's a Louisville team that had seven future pros, seven future first round draft picks. Yikes. Uh, in the second round, they were the 11 C, but had had a really disappointing year. That's Purvis Ellison and that whole crew. Um, Purvis had won a title as a freshman. This is a couple years later. Yeah, and, never nervous Purvis. Yeah, they were like they were like 16 and 13 or something and really underwhelmed in the regular season. They get the 11 seed and, you know, they got Danny Crum. He's a championship coach and Jim Yusevich got in early foul trouble and we just were no match for Purvis and Felton Spencer and their size inside. Um, but that was the most fun year. Like we literally had a blast sharing the ball, playing the games. We, we felt we were unbeatable at times. Um, so that's the most fun I had. And my senior year was a little discouraging, disappointing. We lost Yusevich, Taylor, Chapman. We did return Toulson and Hawes with me for our senior campaign. And we finished like 16 and 14. We just didn't have a lot of help. And we played in no postseason play. That was the most disappointing. Danny Ainge was the leading scorer in the school history at the time. And, and I was like three games away from either tying him or surpassing him. And so we go to the first round of the tournament, which was at the U and Hawaii beats us in overtime. And now I'm thinking, oh gosh, we're not getting into the tournament, but we'll get into the NIT. We didn't even get a bid to the NIT. It was like a really abrupt end. But I loved our time there. Uh, just like, I, I'll tell you one story that just give you an idea of how I thought and how I approach games. Games at home were at seven o'clock. I used to show up at three o'clock for those home games. And you're going to think I'm crazy. And this is going to bring back stories of Tom Brady and deflate gate. But I would go grab the racket balls at three o'clock. I'm the only person in the Marriott Center at three o'clock. And I would go through all of them and I would pick the one that had the best feel, had the best texture between new and old, right? I didn't like a ball that was too old and I didn't like the newest one. So it had to be worn in a little bit, but not too much. It had to be just so right. I'm not blessed with big hands, even though I'm 6'10", small hands. So I really wanted the ball to, to feel the right way. Well, here's how crazy I was, Jason. I would get that one ball. I had a pump and a needle too. And I would get it to the right inflation level. Like it bounced perfect. It was soft enough, but not too soft. You know, now you're having visions of deflate gate. But I'd get the ball perfect. <laughs> and then I would put all the, brothers, all the other balls aside and I would shoot with that ball for two hours from three to five. Still no one in the building yet. No one, no players, no coaches, nobody's there. Maybe an usher somewhere or somebody cleaning. Now I've spent two hours with that ball. I put a big X on it with a Sharpie and circle it. And I'd go take that ball and put it in my locker and lock it up. And I'd leave the other balls out there. Then around 536, when people started showing up, I'd go grab that ball and walk it down to the official's door and hand it to him and say, here's the game ball. And okay. That's thanks. the one you play with. Yeah. So <laughs> all the other story. players, all the other players and teammates are warming up with the other rack of balls. And in my mind, I'd spent more time with the game ball than anyone other, anyone else. And 
I don't know. It was just the way I tricked my mind to think, okay, I'm going to make every shot tonight. Uh, uh, that's my ball. It's perfect. No one else has touched it. Anyway, I did that every home game. Is that weird? It's not weird. It's awesome is what it is. I'm not sure. I, don't, I have no idea if today that would be a violation. I have no idea, but I love <laughs> I that <don't> either. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I, w- I want to go back and to sort of reemphasize something that you said about your BYU career. And you talked about spending two years on your mission in Argentina logically should not help you, but you viewed it as something that helped you. I believe you are the first BYU player who ever served a full-time mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and then was drafted in the first round of the NBA draft. So clearly that re-emphasizes what you felt to yourself, that it actually was something that helped you. It certainly was not a hindrance to your career. And so I, I wanted to ask you, throughout your career at BYU, was the goal always the NBA was that always what was in your sights, or is that something that throughout your career started? you started to gain momentum and thought, wow, maybe this is possible? That's a really good question. Um, I think your self-awareness of how good you can be comes in stages. Um, I had high school teammates two years older who played in all the Los Angeles pro summer leagues, they're called Southern California pro summer leagues. They were high school. And I wasn't aware of any of those things. I just, you know, my dad wasn't aware of those. I didn't do any of those things. And then one day he asked me to come along. This is the summer before my junior year in high school. And he says, Hey, we're short a guy. Do you want to go with me? I was like, sure. I said, you tell me it's a pickup game. No, it's a real game. It's a summer league game, blah, blah, blah. Had nothing to do with my high school, but these were the best players in Southern California of whom I knew nothing about. And this guy, Craig Daly on my team, was our senior point guard. He's like, his family was into it. Like he wanted to play. This was his obsession. And it wasn't my obsession at this point, even though I loved it and practiced hard. I rode with his family, his parents. We went to this game. It was at, uh, I can't even remember the college, but it was downtown Los Angeles. Might have been at Loyola Marymount. Anyway, um, we're warming up and I'm looking down at the other end and Craig's in warm-up lines with me. He goes, see that guy? He's going D1 to DePaul. See that guy? He's going D1 UCLA. See that guy? He's going D1 North Carolina. I was like, what? I go, who are these guys? He goes, don't worry about it. He goes, they're just players. And we finished the game and my team won and I had 43 points. And I, like, I didn't even think anything of it then. But he and his family thought everything of it. They're like, do you realize what you just did to those guys? They're all going D1. You're for sure going to go D1. And I was like, I don't even know what you're talking about. But I just destroyed these guys. So that was maybe the first awareness. Mm -hmm. Um, Freshman year in college, not really. You don't know. You know, it was better than most freshmen in the league. But still, you don't know. Um, The summer before, when I won the U20 gold medal, and you're like, okay, you're one of USA's 12 finest under the age of 20. There's maybe the thought, because every NBA scout was at that whole week of trials and practices when they chose that team. That was a real thrill to win a gold medal against uh, Arvidas Sabonis in Russia, in Mallorca, Spain, for the gold medal. We beat Detlef Shrimp in the semis, his German team. But Sabonis at the time was my age, 18 years old. He was seven, three and a half. He could run, jump, shoot. He put his whole armpit in the hoop. It was uncanny how great he was. You're now seeing his son play for the Sacramento Kings. Yeah. And we didn't see the real Sabonis when he came to Portland, but I did playing against him in Spain. He was incredible. Uh, sophomore year, I led the team in scoring and, and the conference in scoring. And I thought, okay, there, I got a chance. I led the conference in three-point shooting that year. I was like, okay, if I work at this. So there were incremental things. Maybe it's after my junior year. I'm second team All-American, both UPI and AP. And I had every agent in the world calling me, telling me to turn pro because I was already 22. And I guess it's at that point that I'm like, okay, this could happen. And in retrospect, Jason, I should have turned pro my junior year. I was 22. I was second team All-American. I would have been a top 12 pick. As it was, I was the 13th pick. Not a big deal that way. Um, 
but I stayed around my senior year because my mom begged me, you owe it to that school. They gave you a scholarship. You need to finish and support them. And, and I felt that duty. So I stayed my senior year. We had a really poor team. Not a lot of recruiting came in. Uh, like I said, we were 15 and 15, I think, or 16 and 14. I don't remember. But I had to go prove myself at the NBA Combine. It wasn't like, oh, he's a legit first round pick anymore. And then I went to the Combine in Colorado Springs and, and Orlando is where it was. And I just played my tail off and re-solidified that position. So it was line upon line, if you will. You mentioned being picked 13th. You end up going to one of the greatest teams in NBA history with the Boston Celtics, with, with Bird and McHale and Parrish and that, I mean, that whole group, everybody knows that team. What was, what was your experience being drafted because it's my understanding that that's not the team you thought was going to take you but Boston's the one that takes you what was that experience like to be drafted into the NBA it's a great question so the teams who you think are going to take you are the teams that bring you in or fly you in for an interview either a workout or an interview and I flew in and visited teams choosing eight to 16 so I knew I was in that realm right I knew I was in that spectrum uh like Washington was nine uh, Portland was 10, Minnesota 11, Boston 13, Golden State 14, Denver 15, Seattle 16. I you flew still remember the order. I love that. Of course. Uh, like I, I told that. you, I've been blessed with one of these brains that doesn't forget things. But um, so Denver had me in more than once. Uh, Portland had me in more than once. Golden State had me in four times. They picked 14. And that year, Golden State beat the Jazz in the first round of the playoffs, if you remember. Mm -hmm. So that's a Don Nelson, Chris Mullen, Mitch Richmond, but not yet Tim Hardaway because he's in my draft. Manute Bowl is really weird. Rod Higgins it was a weird Golden State team that kind of spread Utah out and took them out of their system and, and nullified the effects of their center play. And it was... Anyway, so if you can imagine, the Warriors are up the road in Salt Lake, and I'm down at BYU, and every day that they were in town, come on up for lunch with Don Nelson. And I'd, I'd like come up, meet with him in the hotel room, and we'd watch a film of my game. Uh, we'd watch uh, my NABC All-Star game where I had 25 points in the college All-Star game. And there's one play in that game where Tim Hardaway's my point guard. I'm coming down the right wing. And he throws it to me on the break, and I just pull up and hit an 18-foot bank shot off the wing, right-handed, just butter. The very next play, I was on the other side of the floor. We get it to Hardaway. I bust my tail, run out the left wing. He threw it to me on the left wing. And Jason, I kid you not, I pulled up 18 feet on the left wing and shot it left-handed off the glass. Swish. Bank okay. swish. And Don Nelson shows me this play, these two plays, and he goes, did you really just do that? I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, you shot it right-handed on this side, left-handed on this side. And I go, yeah, that's, that's kind of how it, that's kind of how it came to me. And he's like, can you do that? And I looked him straight in the eye. I go, of course I can. <laughs> so, I mean, I had four or five really great meetings with the Warriors. I thought they were going to draft me. Boston flew me in for a dinner with the coach and the general manager. And I flew in, got there at four o'clock or something. Uh, went to dinner, stayed the night in the hotel, got up the next morning, flew home. No basketball workout, no IQ test, no psychology questions, nothing. They spent no time. I met none of the players. I didn't see the facility, nothing. I thought, they're not going to draft me. They're not interested. And sure enough, they picked me. And funny story, I hated the Celtics because I was a Laker fan growing up, grew up in <laughs> Los Angeles. They'd had their battles in the 80s. And the next day I was on a flight to Boston for a press conference and I lied through my teeth and said, this is a dream come true. You know, I love this franchise. I can't wait to play with Bird and McHale. And anyway, that, that brings us to that. So let's talk about your time in Boston. When you, I, I've, I've heard you tell stories about those days and with those teammates what stands out to you about your, your days as a Boston Celtic, whether it's games, whether it's the relationships with 
guys that everybody knows. What really comes to mind when you think of those times? Oh gosh, I could tell you so many stories. Uh, Bird Bird was by far the best player I'd ever seen. Now this is year 10 for him. It's actually year 11. He'd been nine years, first team all NBA. His 10th year, he played six games and then had heel surgery and missed the whole season other than six games. I come in as a rookie when he's freshly having missed the whole year before. Um, And believe it or not, he was better than I was, Jason, at everything. (laughs) He was just a little better shooter. He was a little better rebounder. He was just a little smarter. He was a little stronger. He was a little better passer. But then you put it all together and he's all NBA and I'm, you know, looking like I'm not as good as he is. I think they drafted me in the hopes that I would be his replacement. That statement, famous statement by Red Auerbach came back to haunt me because his statement was, you know, Mike plays a lot like Larry, you know, was his statement when they drafted me. And the truth of the matter is, Jason, I did. The other truth is, as I sat on the bench and watched these guys, I lost confidence. For the first time in my life, I watched games and I thought, I don't know if I can do it like they can. Now, it's, I knew I could, like there was belief coming from feedback from practice, but then I'd never sat and watched anybody. Right? I was always the star of every team I played on, and now I'm on the bench, and not only on the bench, I'm playing you know, four minutes a half. So if you can imagine two minutes at the end of the first quarter, two minutes at the beginning of the second quarter, and then the same between third and fourth, and I'm in for bird. And so you could play those eight minutes and the ball might not come your way one time. You might not get one rebound. You might not get one assist. You might get two shots. You might miss them both. And all of a sudden your stat line looks like, what? You were in there eight minutes. You did nothing. But the reality was, Uh, I I just lost a little bit of that confidence. Now, midway through my rookie year, coach came to me one day and said, you're going to start tonight. We were at Golden State. And ironically, we had just played the Clippers and the Jazz on the road. So we're in the middle of a a long road trip out west. And we came and played the Jazz first. And the Jazz crushed us. Stockton and Malone and the crew, they just crushed us. And that's a Celtic team that won 58 games. So we didn't lose a lot, but they beat us. But I got in the last six minutes of the game and I made all four shots in front of like 30 of my friends. So that was super cool. Then we went to LA to play the Clippers. Well, I don't get in a lot there, but I get in at the end of the game for the other reason. We were crushing them. And I made three shots out of four. I had like seven points and nothing flat. And so then we flew to Golden State. Now we're going to play the Warriors. And I don't think I'm going to play at all. And so my brother lives up there. My dad's in town. And they say to me, after shoot around, do you want to go play golf? Like I wasn't a golfer at the time, but I'm like, yeah, I got nothing to do for four hours. You know, except sit in the stupid hotel room. So we went and played golf the day of the game. I don't think I'm going to play. We get to the arena and coach says, Mike, you're starting tonight. I was like, you got it. And I went for 16 and eight. And I was like, okay, we won. The next night we were in Denver. Mike, you're starting again with Bird. And it was fantastic because Bird and I were interchangeable offensively, defensively as well. We guarded the same kind of guys. I was guarding the small forward, Alex English. He was guarding Tim Kempton or somebody bigger. He didn't have to move as much. The next night in Denver, I get 24. I'm like, this is the easiest thing in the world. And it really was easy because I was with Bird. All the attention went to him. I was wide open all the time. The next night, we went home. We played Dallas. Roy Tarpley was the best offensive rebounder in the league. Coach says, Mike, I don't care if you score tonight. Don't let Roy get one rebound. I think Roy had been smoking pot before the game. He was not into it. And he didn't get one offensive rebound. But I went for 21 and 5. And all of a sudden, like, this is happening. And for eight games, I start, culminated by a game against the Bulls, on uh, national TV at the Boston Garden. At halftime, Jordan's got 20, I got 18. Jordan finished with 40, I finished with 20. <laughs> but but it was incredible. And for those eight games, uh, I think I averaged like 18 points, you know, seven boards and four assists in my eight starts my rookie year. So I got over the lack of confidence thing, but I think first impressions are lasting. And I think they felt like I couldn't play 
And of course, this is back in the day when they're not developing players. They're just playing starters, lots of minutes. Bird played 44 of the 48 minutes and he wanted to play the other four. McHale felt threatened when I started those eight games because it was he who wanted to come off the bench. Now he saw what was happening. He's like, I better start again. Coach says, Mike, you're fantastic. You're now going to go from 30 minutes a game to 20. Be ready. Well, I went right back to two or three minutes a game. And again, I'm like, crap. Anyway, to sum it up, um, I honestly think I went to the wrong team. Like I, I should have gone to a team that needed my presence early. And if, if you don't get established in your mind and everybody else's mind in the first three years, it's really hard after that. Then they start to see the warts. Then they start to see the flaws. And if coaches and people on your own team are looking for flaws, you know, they're not going to see the benefits. Right. And I was an imperfect player, right? In the wrong era. I'm in the bully ball era of Detroit's bad guys and Riley's Knicks. Uh, if I played in today's NBA, there's no doubt in my mind, I'd play 14 years and be one of the top three point shooters in the league. And probably I was 15 to 18 points a game. No doubt in my mind. It just was a different time. And I don't blame anyone except myself. I mean, there was a lot of regret on my part for a lot of years. I beat myself up. You know, I feel like I gave up on the dream too soon. I went to Europe too early and played over there. I found great success over there. I would always the leading American scorer in the league. Um, but then I found it impossible to get back into the NBA. So I don't think I should have given up on that. I should have just knocked on the door until I was 38 years old. And as it was, I retired at 33 and began a broadcasting career. So if I could go backwards, Jason, I should have kept trying. But I also had, you know, five kids by then and a young family. Yeah. And I felt the duty of providing and providing a stable life. Coming up after the break, Mike explains going from a professional player to a professional commentator. This is the Deep Blue Podcast on BYU Radio. Welcome back to the Deep Blue Podcast. My name is Jason Shepard. Today's guest is former Cougar basketball player and current Utah Jazz television analyst, Mike Smith. You mentioned that you got into broadcasting, which obviously you still do to this day. The genesis of that, though, was you did have a, a short stint with the Los Angeles Clippers. Is that sort of where the seeds were planted, which ultimately turned into you being one of the team broadcasters? Well, it's a great question because the Clipper broadcaster at the time knew me as the player, the one year I played for them. And some three years later, I've now played in Europe for three years and done BYU basketball for a year. And I'm deciding to embark on a broadcasting career. And so I don't know how to get into the craft, but... That same broadcaster for the Clippers is in town on a Friday night for a Clippers jazz game on a Saturday. So he's in a hotel Friday night in Salt Lake City. I happen to be doing a game that night, BYU somebody, that he flipped through the channels and saw the game, watched the game for a little bit, and realized it was me who had played for the Clippers a few years prior. So that summer, he called me. And he said, I watched you do a game as the color analyst. He goes, I think you should do play-by-play -play rather than color commentary. And I was like, what? And he goes, I think you could have a long career as a play-by-play -play guy. I was like, seriously? He goes, yeah. He goes, and if you're willing and want to, I'll work with you. I'll teach you how to do play-by-play. -play. I was like, huh? Really funny story. So he lives in the same part of Southern California as I do. Well, so I take him up on the offer. And I say, okay, teach me how to do play-by-play. -play. And he goes, it's quite simple, Mike. He goes, your career's not good enough that you're going to get the highest jobs in NBA television because your, your career's just not noteworthy enough. He said, but, he goes, as a former player who does play-by-play, -play, you'll become the most unique broadcaster in the business. I was like, that's a good idea. And at the time, the only one who had ever done it was Hot Rod Hunley. 
Mm -hmm. right? Hot rep played in the league, became a great play-by-play -play guy. So this guy taught me how to do play-by-play. -play. And it was many sessions at his house over that summer. And he goes, I don't know what the Clippers are going to do, but I just know that they're not pleased with their radio play-by-play -play guy. And I was like, okay. So after working with him all this time, we put together a tape. This is literally me watching a game on the television on mute calling the game as if I were sitting there with a microphone and a cassette deck. Okay, this is almost 30 years ago, a cassette deck. And we did a quarter of that game and I sent it to the Clippers. And they said, no, no, you know, no, 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 no former players can do play by play. And, and I knew they hadn't listened to it. And so I called them back three days later. I said, did you listen to the tape? And they're like, no, but you know, there's just no way, you know, play by play guys. We have a play by play guy. And I said, well, listen, I said, I can do your games in Spanish too. And they're like, seriously? I go, yeah. I go, you don't have TV Spanish. You don't have radio Spanish, but the Lakers do. I said, I could do both those things. And they're like, no, there's no way. They go, but that's an interesting thought. Let us think about it. They called me back three days later. They said, no, we're not interested. It's too much work, blah, blah, blah. And I go, did you listen to my tape yet? No. Finally, they listened to the tape and they listened to the tape and hired me on the spot. They called me up and said, hey, we listened to the tape. We're going to hire you as our radio play-by-play -play guy. I was like, what? So in essence, 1998 is a lockout year. That year starts in January. I think it's a 50-game season, but it goes all the way through May. Uh, Tim Duncan had been the first pick the year before. This year, Michael Oldowick Candy, the Clippers had the first pick. I'm the radio play-by-play -play guy for the Los Angeles Clippers without a partner, without a co-host or an analyst. So I learned your craft. I was doing radio and I was doing play by play and I was painting the scene. I did that for four years. In the midst of those four years, Bill Walton was the Clippers TV analyst. He had conflicts with national games. And whenever he had a conflict, they would bring me over to do television color and we would hire a young college kid to come do the radio play by play. And that's kind of how I hone my craft at both. But uh, I guess one of the cool things is not the number of Emmys I've won as a TV analyst now, but is the fact that Hot Rod and I are the only two ever to do, to have played in the NBA and do radio play-by-play -play for the NBA. That's that's awesome. And full disclosure, and I'm, I'm not just saying this because you're the guest on the podcast today. I, I am an NBA honk. I can't get enough of the NBA. Obviously, I'm a Utah Jazz fan, die hard, always will be. But I've had the NBA League Pass for as long as it's been around. And I very much enjoy the late night West Coast games because usually by then the kids are down, you know, everything's kind of quiet, and you can just sit and watch a game. I would always tune in to Clippers games because I absolutely loved you and Ralph Lawler on the TV broadcast. It was an enjoyable broadcast, and I would just come back again and again and again. I had no connection to the Clippers, but I enjoyed your broadcast so much because of the way you guys would bounce off of each other. What was that relationship like with Ralph Lawler, who is no longer doing the games, hasn't for, for several seasons, what was that experience in the relationship life like with Ralph at the time? Well, I feel like I owe my career to him because he saw something in me and was willing to teach me the craft. And of course, he's an old radio guy. He was an old DJ. Um, he, he used a handheld mic even when he was doing television with a, with a one ear. That's right. In. Not, he didn't wear a headset like most guys do. And to cough, he would move his microphone away. And he was just an old school radio guy. So he really got it. Like he understood, he understood how radio should be. And, and he taught me all that. And we were dear friends for uh, the majority of those years, 18 of those 20 years, his last two years broadcasting, his wife began to travel. She'd retired from her career and began to travel with us on the team plane and everything. So we no longer had our typical dinners and time together because he was spending that time with her. But he was crafty. He was smart. He prepared like no other. And so those habits became mine. Um, 
I tried not to copy his phrases because, you know, you, you don't want to copy someone else's, but he had a lot of great phrases and a lot of good one-liners. Um, he used to say first to a hundred wins. That's right. And it was true like 98% of the time. Um, man, we had some funny, funny, <laughs> funny lines and exchanges, you know, I, I probably shouldn't say them on the air, but, um, <laughs> they were just some really hilarious back and forth, but the Clippers were not a good team for the majority of those years. So we had to be entertaining. And he taught me the craft of staying ahead of the action. So like, you know, Chris Paul, you know, on the right side, kicks it to Jamal Crawford in the corner for three. You have to let the audience live the flight of that ball with, you know, with the players and then let them hear the swish of the net and then good, you know, or whatever you would say. I used to say three ball from the corner. And then if he made it, I would say pocket, like corner pocket. Yep. Like that was my call if he made it. But uh, I see a lot of guys in today's league who don't stay up on the action. They're, they're worried about all the stats and they're worried about, you know, getting in so Amen. much information because we have so much information. But Ralph taught me to stick with the basics when you're doing radio play by play time and score and describe it best you can. I drive down the freeway and he taught me to describe everything I could possibly see on the freeway, never using the same word twice as fast as I could with as many adjectives as I could. And that's how I, I trained my brain to call a game. You know, you were, instead of yeah. saying the green exit sign, you were saying the rectangular sign, you know. What a great yeah. exercise. Oh, it, it, and you know, for those of us who are in the craft of broadcasting, boy, it just forces your mind to go faster. It forces your mind to reach for words that you wouldn't typically use. It's not the rim. It's the orange circular iron. You know, it's, you know, I used to say when a guy was dribbling or he was just in the same place, he's just waving to the floor with the ball in the way. So you'd paint an image of, oh, you could see the listener saying, okay, he's just standing in the same place. He's just kind of waving with his hand up and down. But anyway, I love that. I miss that. Um, I don't think I'll ever be a radio play-by-play -play guy again, but uh, it was a fun <laughs> time in my life. I know that the time with the Clippers did not end the way that you would have wanted. And I will, you can take this wherever you want to go with it. I, I certainly don't want to lead you one way or the other, but take me through what ultimately led to you not doing the broadcast with the Clippers and then the opportunity that presented itself here with the Utah Jazz. It's a great question. Um, I have no idea. Like, truthfully, I don't know for a fact what happened. Uh, we did get new ownership two years before my departure. We did get a new president. Uh, we did get eight new vice presidents. They were making wholesale changes everywhere. Um, my owner for the majority of those years was Donald Sterling. Um, you can say what you want about Donald Sterling and what went down with that you know, racist episode and him being banned from the NBA for things he said or did. But I only have the kindest of feelings for the man who employed me for 18 of my 20 years there and treated my family like gold and treated me like gold. So I'm not saying he wasn't what people say he was. Uh, I just never saw that side. And I only saw the ownership that was loyal. I then experienced new ownership that two years later was telling me three weeks before the season began that they were gonna go another direction. So I don't know the genesis of that or how it came about. I did call the owner right away and I said, you must be making a mistake. I don't know what's going on. I said, I've been with this franchise for you know, 20 years. I've helped build this brand. I said, when your team sucked, you know, I was the one keeping them a little bit, you know, vibrant and people aware of them. And we, we kept them uh, uh, in the awareness of people. And, and I had people come to my aid when they found out I wasn't broadcasting. Clyde Drexler and Steve Kerr are dear friends of mine. The, the first week of the season, I'm not on any telecast. And they're like, what the heck happened? What'd you do? I go, I didn't do anything. <laughs> you know, it was my, um, they wrote personal letters to the owner and said, I don't know what you're doing, but this is one of the great guys in our business and certainly one of the great broadcasters. And you just kicked him to the curb for no reason. And then I got a letter from, uh, well, I got a phone call from my lawyer who had a phone call from the owner's lawyer who said, 
tell Mike to stop harassing the owner as if oh, I gosh. was, you know, propagating these, these emails to him, which I wasn't, I never asked anybody to do that, but that's the story. Three weeks before the season started, I thought I was going in to sign a new contract and they said, Hey, we're going to go another direction. And so that was shocking. And uh scary at the time i still had kids in school and certainly kids in college wow i had six kids at either byu and uvu at the time so i was like holy cow i just lost a you know a, a hefty income for the year what are we going to do and i guess there's always a silver lining you know you go through a couple three weeks of like like seriously what am i going to do yeah uh, i'm thinking i'm a 50 at the time, two-year-old white male, how am I going to get a job in broadcasting in today's world? And you can take that for whatever it is. I just, I just thought those jobs don't come at this age to anybody. They're going younger. They're looking for more diverse. And I was just like, wow, I might have broadcasted my last game. And that year I did ESPN radio, national radio. So thank goodness somebody saw my talents and put me out there every week. I was doing a different game, NBA game, national radio uh, with Mark Kestashier or some play-by-play guy. And that was a blast, but it certainly didn't pay like the other. And I will forever be grateful to the Utah Jazz. Now, this is a pre-Danny Ainge Utah Jazz. This is a pre-Ryan Smith Utah Jazz. Those guys are my dear friends and golfing buddies. Danny could be my best friend in the whole world. And they're not involved with the team then. Most people now think, oh, you just got the job you got because Danny hired you. And I was like, no, I'm hired before. You predate them. Yeah, I predate both of them. But um, a guy named Don Sterling works for the Larry Miller Foundation or company. He's kind of a... C-suite exec for the Utah Jazz. He's involved in my inclusion to the Jazz or my coming aboard. Jeremy Castro was there at the time, VP of Broadcasting. And he calls me out of the blue and says, are you not doing any games for the Clippers? I'm like, nope. He goes, I don't need to know why. And I go, there's no reason why. And he goes, you are way too good not to be doing games. He goes, I'm going to find you 30 games. If I find you 30 games this year, will you come fly in and do them? What am I going to say? I go, yes. (laughs) He then says the next year, I'm going to find you 35 games next year, which he did. He then says, I'm going to find you 40 games the next year, which he did, and playoffs. And then the next season, they let Matt Harpering go, and they said, we're hiring you full time. We'd like you to move to town, and that's kind of it. But I look at it as one of the great blessings in my life that they, you know, were just not so content with where they were. They went out of their comfort zone, saw an opportunity and reached out to me and said, come be a part of this. And uh, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the great treasures every day that I get to work with Olema Harrington. Like that guy is a pro's pro. And he, he knows what to say, when to say, how to direct traffic. He has treated me like one of the team from the day I got here. And you know, in our world, that that doesn't happen, right? Like I was the newcomer coming in, joining a very veteran crew that knew each other well. And he just put his arm around me and said, welcome to the team. You're my brother. And let's go knock this out of the park. And that's the way it's been from day one. He didn't have to do that. He could have taken four years to get to know me and find out I'm a decent guy and build some chemistry together. But he opened his arms and said, we're going to be awesome from day one. And so I'm grateful for that too. And I love what I do. It's, you know, um, we have a fun job. We do. We have a fun at the end of the day, our job is fun and that's exciting. Yeah. The, 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 the only, you know, thing I don't like about our job, it's impossible to duplicate ourselves. Right. I can't, I can't create 20 guys underneath me. Yeah you know, like a law firm and you become a partner, you are only as good as your last performance, which, which is, I guess, keeps us on our toes, right? Well, Mike, we have kept you way longer than I'm sure you anticipated, but uh, I cannot say thank you enough. This was an absolute thrill. I enjoyed it. Um, Thank you so much for doing this. I really do appreciate it. 
Well, you're great at what you do, Jason. Uh, like you just led me along this path. You got to every <laughs> possible topic. So that was fantastic. Uh, uh, I love being on. Happy to do it anytime. Feel free to call me and be happy to help. All right. Well, I appreciate it. Thanks once again to my guest, Mike Smith. My name is Jason Shepard. Josh Bergstrom and Ben Hall produced this episode. Deep Blue's senior producer is Cleon Wall. You can download and subscribe to Deep Blue on all podcast platforms or find all episodes on the BYU Radio app. Deep Blue is a production of BYU Radio.